My name is Christian Ashley, a seminary student and servant of God, and you are listening to the Let Nothing Move You podcast, a proud member of the Anazal Ministries Podcasting Network. Welcome back, everyone, to our next episode. This time we're going to be focusing on Luke 14. Uh, just once again, as I always would like to do at the beginning, just thank everyone for sharing the show, for hyping it up to people around you, and you know, just getting us some more views and listens. Listens to what I should say, being that this is you know an audio medium. <laughs> so, without any further ado, we're going to go into the Book of Luke, and we're going to be starting in chapter fourteen, verses one through six. One Sabbath. When he went to dine, that he being Jesus, at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply, to these things. So starting off, uh, dropsy from my research apparently is a bit of an outdated medical term. They prefer the word edema, E-D-E-M-A. And my mother's screaming at me. That's not how you pronounce it. Maybe I was right. Who knows? Uh, which is likely, excuse me, that this whole process edema is when the body accumulates large amounts of excess, uh, excess liquid in certain regions that can make it difficult for sufferers of this like to walk sometimes it can cause their body to itch to the point where people can easily cut through the skin when they're trying to alleviate their suffering from the itching it's not uh one to one to leprosy but like it, there are some parallels there in that regard either way something you don't want to have to deal with so just what dropsy is for those who are unaware like me from the very beginning thank god luke is such a doctor he understands these terms that we're able to figure out what's exactly wrong with people to even further the glory of Jesus in this moment of healing something that especially then uh, no one could do. I'm pretty sure there are lots more treatments now. Uh, yes, in fact, I do because I was researching that. But point being, they could not do the same things we do. But Jesus could, once again, conquering nature to help a child of God who had been suffering for who knows how long in this case. We also see Jesus once again I think uh, the phrase Jesus once again has been used in my notes a little too often, but you know what? It, he kind of, he does it a lot, guys. He he shames the Pharisees with a simple question, which, which is, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Yes or no, plain as day, are you going to answer this question? Well, if the Pharisees answer yes, then they have to retract their earlier statements about Jesus being wrong to heal on the Sabbath which makes their self-created rules look foolish and makes them look foolish to the point of, oh, well, I thought you people knew what you were talking about. And this guy who doesn't have the same training as you do stumped you? Well, who should I be listening to? The person who was right, right? Well, if they say no, then they look like they don't care about the people under their care. Neither option looks good to them because they're selfish, because they're prideful. They instead choose silence, taking the coward's way out. Now, look, not all cases, I, I had to think this while I was going over my notes, like not all cases of being silent or not taking a side are necessarily wrong. Sometimes the best thing you can do is shut up and then move on and go to a different topic elsewhere or talk to someone after an argument has been had. Sometimes that's not what you need. But there will always be times when we are faced with two choices and we must pick one or the other, and that will reveal a lot about our character. Choosing not to engage in these times is going to weaken our witness and harm the people around us because, well, they didn't take a side. Well, maybe I don't have to either in this regard, or maybe I can be silent when such and such topic is brought up. No, that's not good. But also notice here, Jesus won this debate. If we were, if this was live, yeah, Jesus asked this question in front of the Pharisees. People were going, ooh, and it's like, man, they can't respond. It's like, he won this debate, yet he didn't win the other side over to his point. I'm saying a lot of this to me. As a very argumentative person who loves debating ideas and beliefs, it never ceases to be infuriating to me when I am on my A game. And I have 
all the right answers to questions uh, to, to offer to that situation. And yet, even with all that, someone refuses to accept the truth that are, of the matter, and they just remain in their own lies. Whether, I mean, that could be something like an argument revolving around the gospel or, or uh, science or logic or what have you. Sometimes it's not going to work, no matter how good you are at arguing. Sometimes it will. And that's been very fruitful sometimes. In fact, we on a systematic ecology, we just had a, a, a mini debate on this topic of uh, arguing for the sake of arguing and then arguing to bring someone to have a point or like, is it fun to argue? I would say it's very fun to argue. So coming from a very argumentative family, like it, it's fun to debate things. Like I, I've even taken things and built an entire argument about things I don't believe in because it's simply just fun. And it also helps me figure out, okay, this is where that person's coming from. Okay, they believe this, this, and this, not because they're evil, not because, you know, they're against me, but because this is where their conclusions came to. So let me figure out how that happened while also still believing what I believe, unless there's something that contradicts that. And I go, wait, oh, so the point I'm on is wrong. Let me then change my mind correctly to the correct position not out of weakness or fear or what have you, but because it's right. Little tangent there. But going back to the point, Jesus won this argument. That there's no question in this matter. Let this all be something that we can learn from. The greatest speaker and debater of all time was Jesus. Not Paul, not Peter, not David, not Solomon. No one was better than him. And even his sound arguments failed to win everyone over to his side. He that failed to get people on his side when he is 100% correct. So look, sometimes we need to fight for the sake of those listening so that the truth can be spoken and not denied. But other times, Christian, we need to learn when to stop. Jesus didn't remain with the Pharisees after winning this debate because he knew they were a lost cause. He didn't want to give up on them. He didn't want them to go where they're going to end up going. But it would be a waste of his time to change their minds knowing they would never change. Do the same when this happens in your life. I say this to you and I say this to me. Not because of some like fake superiority. I won the argument, so they'll just have to wrestle with it for a bit. <laughs> Those poor fools. Like, no, but because it's not worth the effort that you and I could be using to fight a better battle. Not, not every battle has to win the war. Not all wars are going to be won. Learn that. It'll save you a lot of time and effort. And we'll go from there to verses 7 through 11. Now, he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down at a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Sorry, I just had I mean, an issue with the ESV right now. There's, I think it happened like last episode too. There was a time where my mind wants to put the word the in front of table, and this is the second time that's happened, and it's infuriating. I'm pretty sure that's like a translation thing they chose to do on purpose, and I'm not having it. <laughs> so to get on topic, instead of being petty. It is natural for humans to want to be seen as the best and important. Like, look, we matter. God created us. We matter to him. Like, we are important to an extent. Notice the pause there, to an extent. Several of us even have talents that make us better than most others we see in our everyday lives. There are people I talk to that understand chemistry way better than me. You know why? Because I may be able to learn a definition, but once you start getting into the maths, uh, uh, sorry, maths would be British. It, once you start getting into the math, once you start getting into, okay, well, this bond will happen here. And that means this has to move over here. I'm stupid. And like, I look up at them and say, oh man, 
I'm so glad I can learn from you in this regard because if someone asked me that question, I wouldn't be able to help them. Or it's like, hey, like I'm having an issue with my plumbing. I'm having an issue with my car. I'm not the person you're going to ask because I'm worthless with my hands if it doesn't involve typing or you're picking up a page in a book. I go to them for that. But there are things I'm better at than them. There are things I know more about than them. They have a question about scripture, maybe, or a question about history. Or they say, hey, I'm having a really difficult time in this part of the game. Will you tell me how you got past it? Yeah, sure. I can do that. But that doesn't make me better than them. It doesn't make even what they can do better than me. But in the end, none of that matters compared to the people that you and I can impact by following Jesus's commands here. We are called to be humble and to carry ourselves that way so that others can learn from that example. Christian Ashley wants to be seen as the greatest person in the world. That has never been true, as much as my mind will tell me otherwise. We are called to be humble. Like, like I said, I am one of the worst people when it comes to actually retaining this lesson in my mind. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, like I come from a family of very brash, egotistical, and prideful people, and we are all in some way one of those three. Some of us all three. I would be one of the all three. <laughs> We are always convinced that we are the smartest person in the room, and everyone should recognize that fact as the gospel truth. Sometimes this may even be correct, but that's not the point. The point is to deny ourselves in favor of looking after others. I am reminded of an example from high school when I, uh, I hadn't planned this, so I had to get the story straight. Hold on. Yeah. So I, in... I want to say 11th or 12th grade, had been asked by one of my English teachers who I, I really liked me in her classes. And she said, hey, Christian, would you mind ask, uh, asking your mythology teacher, Miss Groning, if you can come over to Miss Carr's room and just help me out with this? And I said, you know what? Sure, I'll do that. So I went to her class, mythology, which is one of my favorite subjects. And I asked Miss Groning, say, hey, can I go over there and uh, help Miss Carr out? And she said, no, I need you here. And so me, being that uh, prideful brash, little little twerp, uh, egotistical twerp, said, you know, Miss Groning, it's like a, a last act of defiance, like maybe if I say this somehow that'll get me out of this class. You know, Miss Groning, you know I could teach this class, right? And to her credit, she said no. And then I stayed in class defeated. Now, I thought the issue was over because I was young and dumb, even though I was also correct. <laughs> so I get back home and as I uh, park, my mother starts uh, racing out towards me on the street, uh, with fury and rage on her face. So, oh, gosh, uh, who, who else is around here? Uh, who else does my mother hate? I said, no. Uh, she said, you get inside this house right now. <laughs> so I did. And she said, you, you, what you said to you, I, I can't remember the exact words. Some of it I wanted not to laugh in that moment because I knew if I did, I'd get murdered. And I don't think any jury in the world would have convicted her. Uh, so I'm sorry, Mom, if I get any of this incorrect, you can always correct me uh, by talking to me later. He said, you were highly disrespectful to your teacher. You will never do this again. You were going to write back to her or you, you were going to go back tomorrow and you were going to apologize to her tomorrow. I said, I'm not apologizing. I was right. <laughs> so eventually she said, we just wait till your father gets home. So my dad talked to me and said, hey, look, that's not how you handle this situation. You need to go back tomorrow. You need to, you know, apologize to your teacher and we'll move on from this. I said, well, fine. So I did. I gave her an apology and I did mean it. <laughs> but later on, my dad did tell me. So I don't know if this is a broken ASOP or not. You, you can uh, tell me at let nothing move you podcast at gmail.com. If you feel that way, uh, my dad took me aside. I think in that conversation before, if I'm remembering correctly, and said, look, you probably could teach that class. Which, you know, vindicated me. But at the end of the day, the lesson being is like, look, I was not nosed little brat, even if that were true, which I'm fairly certain it still is. It doesn't matter. The point is, there was an authority figure there. My job was to submit to their authority, to be humble in that regard and do what they told me to do. Even though I could have done good elsewhere, that's where they wanted me then. Look, I get back on track to get away from me. Jesus's main points here are that we need to humble ourselves and to avoid situations where we could potentially be humbled, okay? Potentially be humbled, lest we use that as a slight 
uh, excuse me, that slight as an excuse to lash out at others for a perceived wrong that we could have just avoided by not putting ourselves at the best seat at the table. There's a better way of doing these things, people. It may seem contradictory at first, but the humbled will be exalted bef- above those who desire the need to be exalted because they will be faithfully following Jesus and their work will be far more rewarded than the richest or most powerful people on earth. Guys, it's it's not instant gratification, which is one major reason why we all fail to follow through with this command. But it is one that will be given when the time is right. Be patient and wait for God to praise you before praising yourself, Christian. <laughs> uh, verses 12 through 24. Okay. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who recline at table with him, there it is again, that at table, I want to find that translator, I want I do very unchristian things to him. Um, yeah, at table with him heard these things. He said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he, Jesus, said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent a servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. We cannot have fun as a couple, apparently. So the servant came and reported these things to the, to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Jesus calls us all to look after those who can never reward us the same way. If we seek some kind of reciprocal uh, karmic relationship with everyone we meet, the constant call to keep things in that kind of balance that is demanded of that situation will ruin our time with them. If that's what we expect, I gave you this, you should give me that. I prepared this for you. When I come to you, you should prepare this for me. Like there's nothing wrong with having parties. There's nothing wrong with going out and hanging out with people or giving gifts. But if we expect reciprocation, we're missing the point of why those gifts matter. If we say, well, oh, man, at the party I hosted, uh, the food was better, the drinks were better, like the people were better, this party sucks. And that's that's not helpful. I mean, sure, maybe something isn't quite up to our taste, but does that matter in the end? Were we the ones who were in charge? Are we the ones taking advantage of the free food and company and drinks? There are better battles to fight. Like... Like Once again, he's not saying that we never hang out with our loved ones, but he is saying that we need to make sure those are not the only people we associate with. I don't, in my everyday life, go to the poor, go to the needy, go to the ill. I don't always have the time. I don't always know where to go, number one. Number two, sorry, got my numbers off. But I have to see moments where I can and then seize upon them, not ignore them and say, well, I'll come back later. Or, uh, I don't know if now's the right time. Like, look, look for situations around yourself. Is there a soup kitchen near you? Does your church have something where, does it, do they have a prison ministry? Do they have uh, Alcoholics Anonymous? Do they have um, a, just... Are they going to be part of a festival in your county and everyone else is going to be there and you're going to see people you've never seen before and you can reach out to them in that regard? Like, Find ways to help out. Is there a mother in your church who has no support 
and doesn't know where dinner is going to be the next day. And she's working uh, as to double shifts just to be able to afford rent. Like, can you offer money for rent? Can you offer food? Can you offer child care? Like, look for those opportunities and then seize upon them. Or if you can't, find someone who can. Because if they're not aware of it, which probably they aren't, how are they going to know there's a need if one hasn't been established? Look for opportunities, seize them, and don't expect something back in return. Because guess what? At the people holding these banquets here, they were going to one-up them next time. They were going to say, oh, well, he had uh, seven different kinds of wine. Well, I'm going to find a wine from, from, from Egypt and Phoenicia and Italy and Greece. And like that's going to show them up. And then, whoa, they'd had that one. I got to find one from Persia. I got to find one all the way from India. It's like, that's not why we do these things. Do, do have parties. Do have fellowship with each other. But don't let that be our only way we interact with other people. So I'm going to give this story. I debated whether or not to put this here. I mean, the, as someone, like I mentioned before, I'm a very prideful person. So I'm always very careful. I always second guess myself. There's a story that portrays me very positively in a lot of regards. Like, am I telling that story because like, it's something that can help someone? Or am I saying that to say, hey, hey, look what I did. Aren't I the greatest? It's like, like I said, like, that's something I've had to learn over life is when a story is has been a blessing that God has given me and I can use that to extend a blessing to elsewhere? Or is it a story where I did something really good and, oh, look at me, look at me, aren't I the greatest? So I'm hoping that this is me recognizing a time God impacted me in my life recently to where I can then hopefully inspire someone else, maybe not to do the same, but to find something else they can do in that regard. So all that to say, I give this as an example and not some shallow attempt to make myself look better. That is my hope and prayer. So the other day, I was getting uh, some uh, food at rallies, uh, going through the drive through And when I was waiting for my food, I happened to see a homeless guy like begging for money at the center of the street that I would have to pass by at that time of day so I could get out. I felt at that moment every call possible to go to him when I inevitably had to stop at the light beside him and offer him some money. I don't have a lot of money. <laughs> I'm a very poor seminary student who just had to take out a loan for next year. And like, I don't know when money's going to come for that. I don't know when I'm going to be able to get stuff done. So all these things like, oh, you, you just can't do that. You don't know. You don't know if your next paycheck is going to be enough for everything. You don't know if, you know, you're going to receive money from here, if you'll be able to pay off these classes and like all those things. But I kept hearing God commanding me to go help him with the money I had at my disposal. I told him a thousand different reasons why this was a stupid idea. Like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, I, like I said, I don't have a lot of money. Like, Lord, if I do that, like, maybe that's my last, uh, the last money I'd have to buy groceries or what have you. Or, uh, or just like, oh, well, if I give him the money, he's just going to go out, he's going to buy drugs and, or, uh, you get himself drunk and like, I'm just perpetuating you know, uh, stuff that's already harming him. It's like, yeah, sure. Maybe those are both true. Like the poor one definitely is, but it doesn't matter. I, once I got my order, I realized God wasn't going to take no for an answer. So I went over to that light and I motioned for the man to come over and I gave him some money. Uh, we talked briefly and then he went off. That was it. Like we didn't talk about Jesus. Uh, I didn't say, Hey man, come to church. I mean, cause the light was about to change, so I really had no time. But I did. I gave him money. I don't know where it went from there. I haven't seen him since. It's been like two days. The point, the point of all this, that even maybe, maybe even if it did go off and, you know, uh, he used that money to to buy heroin or something, or he used that money and wasted it on food that he didn't need. And like that was going to spoil in five minutes or what have you, all those terrible things you bring up and conjure into your mind. Well, all that money is not going to go anywhere because this person's wasted his life. And uh, the best lesson would be to teach him not to give him my money. It's like, no, the point of that moment in time was God reminding me that one of his children needed help. And I, at that moment in time could be the one to do it, no matter how small the sacrifice. Look, it wasn't a lot of money. I mean, comparatively speaking, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough to put a dent in my wallet. Listen to that voice when it speaks to you. 
maybe it won't be audible. It very rarely is for me. I have heard God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, whoever you want to say in that moment, I have heard that voice say a very clear command, but maybe it isn't audible for you. Regardless, you're going to hear those commands in your thoughts. That's not going to come from yourself. You're not going to be able to ignore it. If you are his, he will be expecting you to listen. Like he expects people who aren't his to listen to what he says. So imagine how much more he is to us who do. I listened that day. There have been plenty of days where I said no, and I drove far past those people in need. Don't make that choice. And I used the word choice and not mistake because I know where my heart was then. It wasn't a mistake that I passed him by. I was like, oh, oh, well, the light's going to change in 15 seconds, and I just got to think, oh, it's going to be too long for me to get my wallet out. It's like, no, I made a choice those days to deny them compassion. Choices, like, like excuse me, mistakes are when we accidentally type the wrong word while we're texting or when we bump into someone because we were distracted by a noise. That's a mistake. Choices are what we decide to do in our hearts of hearts, our heart of hearts. Sorry. We should never confuse those two words and excuse ourselves from our wrongdoing. So I'm saying that as a call to me, I'm putting that as a call to you. So going back to the passage, what we also see here is a man attempting to steer the conversation in another direction. Often, When we speak on spiritual matters, it can get very real. And I use the word real because that's exactly what it is, real. And we recognize where we aren't in our spiritual walks. So we decide to diffuse the awkward silence with maybe some humor or to say some hollow pseudo Christian statement that, you know, so that we can just stop lingering there in that conversation. We can just move on and uh, do something else with our lives. Don't do this. That is the temptation. Don't give in to it. Sometimes that guilt exists for a reason, and we should listen to it and recognize our own failings so that we can improve on our present and future actions. Because look, as long as we keep saying no, we're going to keep in that, that just downward spiral of, well, I didn't do it that time. Oh, I didn't do it that time. Oh, man, I'm so, I feel so guilty about that. I should do it next time. It's like, oh, why didn't I do it last time? So, I mean, I'm already feeling guilty, so I might as well just keep going. But no be better. Don't always steer that conversation away when it starts getting personal. When someone says, hey, like, I I just came back, you know, from a missionary journey. I'm very hyped up and I saw a lot of good things done there. And we go, well, I just kind of stayed home and I didn't do anything all day. It's like, you you don't have to go on a missionary journey to, to, to Ghana or Cambodia or what have you. That's not the point. The point is someone was doing something spiritually well for them and others and we weren't. And we'll go, mm, oh, yeah, that's great, man. So how are the kids? You know, Removing the conversation elsewhere does not help. Let that guilt linger a little bit. So we go, okay, I never want to feel that again. And then go and not do that. Not remain in that guilt. Be positive. Work for others. Also, we see here, Jesus is making a very clear point about the state of the Jewish leaders and their placement in the kingdom of heaven. And this also applies, it applies then and applies now for people who know the truth, have read this book uh, cover to cover multiple times, and yet still don't know him and will say outrageous things or believe outrageous claims that have nothing to do with, with scripture. And they'll make extra rules. I mean, you see all these cults that have started from the fact uh, one of the greatest things that ever happened in the world was the ability for people to uh, just have the Bible in their hands. You recognize what a blessing that is because that was not the fact for a very long time. Uh, One of the worst things that also happened was the fact that the Bible is so readily available to people and that they can make up whatever they want about it because, I mean, there's really no way to regulate that uh, outside of, you know, uh, crusades and inquisitions. And well, that's not always the best response. But these people, these leaders will never enter the kingdom of heaven because they were invited first among all people. Once again, they should have known Jesus was who he said he was before anyone else because they knew their scripture among all people. And yet they spurned God when he sent Jesus on his behalf to prepare them. Instead, since they denied him, God's message is going to go to those who had no riches. They were sick and poor. And we see the ones from the the highways and hedges. That's a clear analogy to the Gentiles who weren't even Jewish by the very definition of that term, which would be shocking to them. 
And yet that's exactly what happened. These people would gladly be welcomed into the banquet and be given everlasting life as a result. The ones who didn't, they will have no excuse for being excluded from this banquet because they had ignored their invitations so that they could focus on their own petty concerns instead. Well, God said to rest on the Sabbath, so I'm going to give an arbitrary amount of numbers of steps, and if I go past that, then I've sinned. <laughs> or like, oh man, I'm going to go into the temple, I'm going to pray to God out loud and say, God, you're so great, and I'm so better than all these sinners here. It's like, how many people do we know who do that in our own lives? They know the truth. They know it's there, but they haven't accepted the truth. It's right beside them, but the veil just hasn't been torn from their eyes. If that's you right now, reach out. Reach out to me. Reach out to a trusted uh, pastor, trusted Christian who's able to help you with those issues. Like, I don't want to be like that. Good. Go beyond that. Find out who he is. Find out what's keeping you away from him. Be better than yourself. And you're welcome into the fold. Like the angels will celebrate at that very moment in time. One of the greatest gifts we ever get is to hear of a new life being created once someone has denied who they used to be and repented of their sins. We'll finish up today in verses 25 all the way through 35. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Look, I've seen these verses used a lot of really bad ways. Let's start with that. Jesus isn't literally saying that we must hate our families, as some might say in this regard. But what he is saying is that those who hold their love for their families above him are completely missing the point. God has given us all families, whether they be biological, adopted, or found along the way. It's going to happen uh, unless you're a feral child out there somewhere, and I don't know how you got access to this podcast, <laughs> which welcome to the team, I suppose. But look, we're all going to have a family of some sort inside, whether we make them or we started with one. They should be a blessing, but they are not more important than him. My mother and father are not more important than God. They didn't die for my sins. My brother and sisters are not more important than me. Brothers-in-law, sister-in-law, none of them are more important. God is more important. So I should put him above them. That's not a betrayal. That doesn't mean I hate my family. It means I love them enough to put them underneath the one who loves all, who created all. The very same applies to our actions and words. We are not literally called to carry a cross. Although I have done that once before for a church event. I wouldn't recommend it, especially if you're as immensely out of shape as I am. <laughs> that thing is heavy. It, it, it's built like a brick. Uh, it's not fun to carry around, which was kind of the point of what we were doing. See, uh, for a little bit, because I hadn't been whipped uh, several times, like, what is it, 39 lashes? Uh, I didn't have a crown of thorns in my head. And it still, it was a lot, but back on track. Instead, we are called to carry the word and deeds of Christ in our everyday life so that there can be no denying who leads our actions, words, and thoughts. Compromising in this area shows that Jesus isn't our top priority, and people will mock us for being wishy-washy because we claim to serve him, yet what we do and say will oftentimes contradict this. Look, guys, people are going to jeer and mock at us either way, 
at least let that be because they are in open rebellion against God and not because they see us fail in our missions to serve Jesus faithfully, if at all possible. No one likes to be mocked. It's not fun. I had to learn at a very young age, like I-, I could dish it out, but I couldn't take it. So I had to learn how to be able to make jokes at my own expense because I'm kind of dumb. For all my intelligence and wisdom, I'm stupid. I say stupid things. I think stupid thoughts. Look, let the reason they hate me, they make fun of me, be because they don't understand. Not because I said, well, Lord, I believe your word, and then I go out and do the exact opposite. Or I compromise and say, well, this isn't really a sin. Like, it's fine. Like, no worries. Like, no, that's some things are fairly black and white. World tries to create some gray. Sometimes there needs to be gray. Never discount that in this life. But some things are black and white, right and wrong. Look, Jesus's example of a man designing a tower and his, his example of a king going to war are perfect for his points here. Going into this mission of serving Christ without stopping to make plans every now and then is always going to end in ridicule and disaster. I love my plans to an extent. Some things I'll wing. Like I go on a trip and on the way there, I don't, I'm not going to stop, you know, exit you know, 357 along the way every single time. Like sometimes see, okay, how much gas is in the tank? Okay, I know there's going to be some towns around this area. I can always go to exit, whatever. That's doable. You're not always going to get screwed over by that. But when it comes to, hey, uh, we're all going out and uh, this person's going to be here. And I don't say, well, okay, what are they like? What do they enjoy? Uh, what can I can and can't I say around them? That way leads to disaster more than likely. Because guess what? People are going to have things that they don't like that you say and it's going to be uh, very uncomfortable. That's the way you could plan. Not every conversation, but it's just an example. So look, make plans every now and then, especially when it comes to that ultimate choice of coming to God and saying, I am yours. Forgive me of who I am. I will serve you forevermore. That is an immense decision. It is going to cost us a lot in this world. Consider that cost first before saying yes to him and then commit to what he has called you to do. And our final topic of discussion tonight uh, on salt. Like, look, as the book says, salt is great. Salt is good. Salt is amazing. I use it all the time, a little too much. Even I put it on food I, before I taste it because I'm used to nothing being up to my standards. Something that's gotten me in trouble a time or two, it's like you didn't even taste it. It's like, oh, well, <laughs> I'm used to it not... Uh, tasting the way I want it to, it's very disrespectful. I should be better about that. But if that very same salt has no flavor and it can't preserve food, it is worthless. So also are Christians who once served God faithfully and now are either apathetic or pretending that they never made a decision to be his in the first place. Like, I I hate to say this, but they should shut up. Like, wrestle with what they're wrestling with now. Don't let anyone bother them. Like, don't let anyone interview them, like have them struggle with God in their own way, in their own time, where it's not in the public eye. Things are bad enough. We don't need excuses out there saying, oh, well, they they walked away. They did this, they did that, all in the name of Jesus. And then they walked away and then that mocking and jeering comes up. It's like, well, all Christians are like that one day. Oh, they say they believe God, but they're just looking for an excuse to get away. Look, such Christians would be better off staying away from others and not speaking up. I'm not saying they have to shut up completely, but they should not speak up because they have lost the flavor of his salvation. That is worthless to the call. That is not helpful to anyone involved. Uh, Oh, what is his name? A guy who wrote, uh, I kissed dating goodbye. What was it's like Josh, uh, Josh, what was his name? (laughs) I am really struggling right now. Uh, Joshua Harris. Thank you. Uh, Google has recently had some issues where he is struggling with his faith, uh, doesn't not where he wants to be anymore, and he's walked away. Um, I don't know his heart. I can't see where he's at. Some of the interviews I've seen him in have been very helpful. Others have been, man, you're just you're angry and people are gonna look at this and go, Oh, well, nothing good is gonna come out of that. That whole Christian thing. It's like and as someone who particularly is not the biggest fan of him having read I Kissed Dating Goodbye and even Boy Meets Girl, uh, two books that uh, were very soul-crushing and awful, 
I, I don't get then get to cheer and say, ha-ha, uh, schadenfreude activated. This man is now suffering uh, because he hurt me in the past, even though he doesn't know me. Like, no, that's also bad. We are called to be salt. We are called to be light. And if that is not where you're at right now, don't speak publicly about it. Talk to friends. Say, hey, I'm wrestling with this. I'm struggling with this. Don't think I'm trying to censor you. That's not the goal here. I want you to wrestle with those things. I want you to doubt those things. And then I want you to come back. And if you don't, stay the course as far as not speaking too publicly about it. Once again, find help. Find people who will listen and are actually there to care for you. But that's that. So ending on a bit of a sour note there. My bad, but that's kind of where the chapter ends. (laughs) So uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, Please, if you get the chance, just leave a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice. Uh, It really helps us with the ratings, with uh, getting people uh, more active, like the as far as analytics go, like anything below a five is considered a failure for some reason, even though you should be able to put whatever you want. But I ask for those fives because they're the only ones that matter in Apple's eyes, in Spotify's eyes, whatever. I don't even know if you can rate on Spotify anymore. I have to look that up. But anyways, if you're interested in my fiction writing, you can find my works at www.starvingwriterskill.com or on Amazon by searching the name MC Ashley. If you're all interested in some further solid studies, uh, involved in the Bible and its teachings, then check out the other members of the Anazal Ministries podcasting network. Contact me at letnothingmovepodcast at gmail.com. And with all that in mind, God bless you all in accordance to his will and not mine. And allow me one more time to remind you, let nothing move you.